Okay, so this is a very brief, um, um, we're going we're gonna to break down chapter 12 of the Church of the East pretty briefly. So in our the more recent Church of the East, in our survey, we have noted how with Aleppo at the starting point and Purge at its center, the Church of the East, known by in the West by the name Nestorian, extended its operations to one territory after another. Arabia, being nearest and most accessible, was one of the first countries evangelized from Persia. India, both north and south, and Sri Lanka were also reached at a very early date. Then came the further provinces of that vast empire, Central Asia, Burma, Thailand, Turkestan, China, and Japan. Perhaps last of all, southern Siberia and Mongolia were evangelized, and China again for a second time. From west to east, from north to south, covering practically the whole of Asia, the representatives of the most missions-minded church the world has ever seen spread the gospel. Whether supported by the labor of their hands or provided by those among whom they labored, they carried the message of salvation to the utmost bounds of the continent. From the 4th to the beginning of the 14th century, they maintained their testimony. Besides their expansion, we have also dealt with the causes which led to their decline in virtual elimination. It remains then for us only to speak briefly about the present condition of those who still survive. Okay, so now this is just to quickly tell you where the pockets of Christianity still remain. So the remnant who escaped the atrocities of Tamerlane found a refuge in the mountains of Kurdistan, where they vanished for several centuries. In AD 1551, they split into two sections, and each of the different factions elected a patriarch. One of these, unable to secure nomination by his fellow metropolitans and in order to strengthen himself against his rival, went to Rome and received ordination at the hands of the Pope. He did not join the Roman communion, however. Instead, he continued Nestorian and lived at Monsiul. When more than 100 years later, at Dyer Echabar and elsewhere, some of the Eastern church believers went over to Rome, the people called them Uniate or Chaldean Christians, while they continued to refer to others as Nestorians. Um... Fortescue estimated that the late latter, so that's the Nestorians, numbered 100,000 prior to AD 1914. Johanna, however, gives the total as 190,000. Either way, the number in 1928 does not exceed 40,000. They have long since ceased to be a missionary church in any sense whatsoever. Professor Johannan in his book, The Death of a Nation, gives a very tragic account of a massacre of Nestorians that took place in 1842 near the River Zab, where the Turks put 10,000 persons to death. They carried large numbers of women and children into captivity. He also gives details of the sufferings and horrors to which the persecuted church was subjected by the Turks and the Kurds in the years since, and closes his account with the words, The prospect of the forlorn remnant who have escaped massacre is piteous in the extreme. And it is said that some 50,000 men and women and children from Persia and Kurdistan were, at the time of the writing, naked, hungry, and homeless. These, with perhaps a few more elsewhere, are all that remain of the Central Asia section of the ancient church. South India and Sri Lanka did not suffer at all from the pillaging of Tamerlane, and the Christian communities there continue to exist, though under different names. The majority of the Christians are now Roman Catholic, one either by persecution or by force. In 1798, the northern part of Malabar in India suffered much from the despotic rule of Tipu Sultan. He destroyed 27 of the most ancient churches and wreaked his fury on both Christians and Hindus. One-tenth of the Christian population perished by sword and pestilence. Only the intervention of the British and the appointment of a British resident to the Indian courts served the Christians, saved the Christians from annihilation. The Christians of Kokan, a city on the west coast of India, fared no better at the hands of their ruler. He subjected numbers of them to cruel tortures and threw many into the sea. Good things also happened in the persecuted areas. An earnest Indian evangelist conducted special missions in one of the pers two persecuted places about AD 1895. Two devoted English women left England and took up residence there in order to help the Syrians in their spiritual life. And finally, a devoted and capable, mis capable missionary conducted annual Christian conventions for the Mar Thoma, or Reform Section, of the Syrian Christian community in southwest India. As a result, the strength of the Reform Party rose year by year from approximately 20,000 in 1893, 35,000 in 1901, until about 114,000 in 1921. In addition to the mission work at home carried on by Mar Toma Christians, they have begun foreign mission work in another language area as well. And so we conclude our survey to the rise and fall of a church which realized in a very special way the burden to which Paul referred when he said, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. To fight, despite the fact that it ceased to be an aggressive spiritual force, the Church of the East has left behind a memory that should be an incentive to us to remain loyal to Christ and devoted to his service. 
Um, and so I wanted to just go over, now we're just gonna kind of summarize some of the appendices. So we're in appendix A, the name. The Church of the East is generally known as the word Nestorian. One of the results of this name is that it branded the Church of the East with a name that carries the stigma of heres of heresy, of heres heresy, her her heresy. <laughs> couldn't get it, heresy. Yet the Church of the East had nothing to do with the dispute between the Nestorians and Cyril of Alexandria. And it was in existence generations before the condemnation of Nestorius. The so-called Nestorians themselves prefer the title of Church of, of the East to distinguish it from Jacobites, Greeks, and Latins. The intent was to apply the name to those beyond the boundaries of the Roman Empire, especially to those who were subjects of the Persian Empire. Um, so the church had a lot of separations from the Church of the East, and those were really because of geography, language, politics, church councils, doctrine. Those were all reasons, and I'm on, I, sum, I just quickly summarize in Appendix A, reasons that they, there was kind of a real separation between the Church of the East and the Church of the West. Appendix B talks about the Bible of the Church of the East. Um, they possess the whole Bible with the exception of Revelation and small epistles of Peter, John, and Jude. Um, and it just talks here about the Bible and what they would have had. Um, and it says that wherever missionaries from the Eastern Church went, they seemed to introduce the art of writing to those whom they sought to, to reach. The missionaries carried their alphabet to India, where it is still in use, and also penetrated the Turkish hordes of Central Asia and even crossed the Great Wall of China. Um, customs and practices of the Church of the East is in Appendix C. Um, and this is talking about the priesthood, um, the church, the rituals, and um, books. I'm not going to go into that. Um, it's just differences, little differences in the way they did things in the Church of the East. And then Appendix D, was Nestorius a heretic? And um, Protestants, Catholics, and Orthodox all agree that Nestorius was seriously mistaken in his views of Jesus Christ. So Nestorius was a monk of Antioch, a man of great eloquence and an austere life. He preached that the man Christ was not God, that God only dwelt in him as in a temple, and that he became God by degrees. In other words, he taught that there were two persons in Christ, the one human, the other divine. Logically, he had to deny that Mary is the mother of God. He said she should be called mother of Christ, but not mother of God. Um, after Nestorius began his teaching, he almost immediately began to create controversy. Um, and so this kind of discusses the, the controversies of the Nestorians and Nestorius. Um, Nestorius is, asserts on page 109 that when he first arrived at Constantinople, he had found a quarrel over the question as to whether Mary was to be called mother of God or mother of man or mother of Jesus, mother of Christ. Um, he was co continually reproached for prohibiting or at least refusing to give Mary the title of mother of Christ. Um, he feared the term would originate false ideas. And for this reason, and because he believed the term unknown to the Orthodox fathers, he had nothing in its favor. So this is where he can be seen as a heretic, um, especially by the Catholic church who views Mary as, um, very important. Um, Nestorius was sent into exile for close to 20 years as a result of this discussion. If he had not been the one sent into exile, Cyril, who is a, um, another guy that basically believed Nestorius thought Jesus was not only truly God from birth, and Nestorius believed that Cyril confused and mixed up the Godhead and manhood of Jesus Christ. Um, So ultimately, the case of Nestorius and Cyril raises questions about relationships in the body of Christ. Indeed, it raises questions about what exactly the body of Christ really is. For example, if a person cannot even conceive the meanings of such terms as divine essence, divine substance, divine persons, may that person be considered a member of Christ's church? If he cannot conceive things like this, he cannot be a heretic like Nestorius. If he cannot be a heretic, can he be a Christian? More fundamentally, we must ask, what faith or practice makes a person a member of the kingdom of God? What faith or practice excludes someone from being a member of God's kingdom? Is it possible that God, in his mercy, might forgive a person for holding some unbiblical view? Is it possible that he might call such a person his son or daughter, a citizen of the kingdom, and a member of the body of Christ? I believe the answers to these last questions are yes. 
And this is from the author. Ultimately, the important question is not about position. Where do you stand on this issue? It is a question of direction. What is your goal? To whom do you run? Do you seek the glory of God or the glory of man? Do you seek the advance of the kingdom of God or the advance of the kingdom of man? Um, so what is your goal? Is your goal to love Jesus? Um, I think that's the bigger question instead of all the little nuances of Christianity. Um, so that's the end of the Church of the East.